But I've already seen this transformation from day one, Jason, going, I got all this time, I got to fill it. And you started filling it with like work-like tasks. They looked very work-like to me versus maybe where your head's at now, like thinking about, okay, this could be a passive income thing, or this could be a passive income thing, or you're being very strategic with how you're spending your time. You're using your time to spend it to get a certain result as opposed to more money. Two lifelong friends document and share their personal stories as they seek financial independence and to retire early. One reaches fire in 2020 during a global pandemic, inspiring the other to play catch up. This is Two Sides of Five. What, what are the lessons you learned, uh, you know, the, the biggest mistake or, you know, thing you would guide people to not do? I mean, every situation is different, but there must be some key lessons in there. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone Maybe asks me this. <laughs> I mean, it's hard because, you know, things are very product specific. I'll give you an example. There's, okay. uh, I built the house behind me in 2007 and this was kind of my first foray into saying, well, I designed this thing once and architects have, they own the copyright to their design, no matter what, you know, if a client pays you a million dollars to do design a home, you still own that design and the copyright to it. Okay. And so, my initial idea when I started the business was to just say, I'm going to take this plant set. I'm just going to sell it out. And so, you know, I, I did a whole blog series on it for many, many months, you know, design and construction. And it was a dwell houses we love finalist. And so there was, there was some press kind of built around it. And so I thought, okay, I'm going to capitalize on this package, that plan set up. And, um, I think it was selling it for maybe $2,500, um, you know, just the full on plan set. And mm -hmm. what you, what I learned is it's not just about creating the product, right? It's also about setting the price and you got to know yeah. the market that you're selling into. And so I'm selling a house that would cost, you know, depending on the market between two and four, a hundred thousand dollars, let's just say. Okay. And so that type of customer, <laughs> they don't see a lot of value in buying an architect design plan set. And right. for as cool as I think the house is, not a lot of people I like your house. Yeah, appreciate that. But not a lot of people <laughs> saw that same value. So, you know, I started playing around with a price point that would make sense for somebody. Okay. So I get down to let's say fifteen hundred dollars for the plan set or twelve fifty or whatever mm -hmm. uh it was that I settled on. And so so then what you do is you start selecting for people who only want to spend, say, a thousand bucks on a plan set. But they have this expectation that they're getting an architect designed plan set. So it's number one, it's got to be perfect. Number two is they're expecting you to make changes. And the way I designed the plan set was I left stuff out intentionally so that I could use it as a business generator. So for example, wow. there's no garage, right? And everyone wants a garage except for me, yep. apparently. <laughs> <laughs> and so I thought, well, I'll just leave the garage off. And then when someone buys the plan set, for sure, they're going to hire me to do consulting time. So, you right. know, I intentionally designed this passive income generating product to then require active services to, you know, work with the clients. And, and it was, you know, I arrived there because I wanted to get clients. And I thought if I can get people to buy into my design aesthetic, they're going to, you know, buy the plan set, but then they're also going to build it. And then I can start building my portfolio out and they'll tell their friends and they'll lead to bigger projects. So there was a custom birdhouses, you know, whatever right. it takes. <laughs> right. <laughs> Believe me, I considered that. Um, <laughs> yeah. Crazy stuff. I can't I mean, even imagine how awesome your, your, and uh, your, your birdhouse would be. <laughs> well, it was going to be a long birdhouse, you know? And the, so the two sides, <laughs> it's like a Viking long, long, that was the initial idea for this. But anyway, um, so, so, um, you know, Lessons learned there, there's just a, there's a million of them because, you know, you learn the market that you're selling to, you learn all about packaging the product up and then, you know, people would buy the thing and then say, uh, I meant to buy the three bedroom set, not the two bedroom set. So meanwhile, right. they have the two bedroom set. They've already downloaded it. They own the PDF and they're like, can we just trade it? Oh man. Well, no, because that's a different thing. <laughs> you know, oh, I meant to buy the dog trot, not not the long house. It's like well, I'm not just going to give that to you. And so it Right. Oh it, man. It introduced this whole realm of customer service to me and eventually I ended up shutting that sort of plan set arm of the business down. Number 1 because I didn't need all the clients that it was spinning my way and number 2 
I just found it to be kind of a pain to deal with it, you know? And so it really sent me off in search of something that would truly be more passive. And I think if if the, the real lesson there is if you're going to design something to be passive, make sure it's a hundred percent passive or as much as you possibly can. Like that appropriate pack. When I first released it, people were having trouble figuring out how to get the files onto their iPad. So I was like, all right, I'm not going to, this isn't going to turn into a customer service nightmare. I'm just going to record a very specific video. Start here. <laughs> right, and, I exactly. little, and I broke it down and showed them. And as dumb as that sounds, that one little activity has saved me so much heartache and headache, you know, sure. and I, those are lessons anyone can learn. Um, yeah. and, but in a lot of ways, it only comes from experimentation and, yeah. and yeah. just, and thinking about things with a systems mindset, which I know you know, you, you definitely have, but tell, I want to know from you, um, you know, this distinction between side hustle and, um, passive income earning. I mean, do you see for yourself actually seeking out side hustles? Because I remember you telling me about this kind of cookie business that you guys were considering at one point. Right. And there's maybe a brewery kind of thing. Like talk a little bit about that. So the cookie idea was was one of Lori's ideas, and that was definitely to the tune of a side hustle. Um, I don't know. For me, I think the distinction is maybe <clears throat> plainly, someone has a main, usually a main income stream, right? I have a someone has a day job, and then they start doing something on the side, um, you know, and not necessarily with any intention of it ever growing beyond uh, a certain size or scale but just to generate some additional income. Certainly you and I have followed, you know, shows like Side Hustle Show, great one, if you don't follow Nick Loper folks. Um, And some of those people, or and certainly some of the ones he chooses to highlight, go from a side hustle to a main stream of income. But a lot of those are very active. Um, Totally. Right, or or, unattractive. (laughs) Right, for sure. But one idea that Lori did get from uh, Side Hustle Show was uh, low content publishing. And so, you know, she'll sit in Canva. So it's the idea of, you know, making journals, log books, um, anything that, you know, is a Kindle self published piece, but that you don't have to go and write a book for, right? You could just have like a pass, uh, one of her bestsellers. Is, is legitimately a password logbook, which is something that particularly, you know, senior citizens really like. Yeah. And so you could design that thing once and just keep sticking different covers on it. Sure. You know, she has one that is, um, it looks like a regular book. So, you know, you can be discreet, hide it in plain sight and just keep changing the cover and listen them on Amazon and their passive income generators. Yeah, yes, there's awesome. a little active work to sit in Canva and design the cover, but she really enjoys that, right? It you know, scratches the creative itch. She could just be watching TV and doing that. Um, so that's something that is very much side hustle, but also largely passive income generation. Yeah. Never, never going to be something that pays the mortgage, but is just something, again, on the side that you can do. And certainly for me, I have thoughts of doing things like that. But I more these days am thinking about, you know, how do I take a skill I already have or how do I build a skill that I'm interested in and have that create some kind of digital asset, for example, um, that can have a life of its own. So, for example, you know, leveraging um, some of the things I've learned throughout my career or through my hobbies, you know, could result in a book. And a book is a, a, is a absolutely an asset that, and this is something I, I will ask you about, right? <laughs> that you put time into to write and lay out and and get ready for publication. But especially if you're doing self-publishing, once that that digital file is with Amazon or whoever you use and is ready to go, well, people can just order it. Yeah. Now, yes, an active part of that could be, you know, what kind of marketing do you do? You know, how do you you know, do you blog around it, right? It becomes a little more active depending upon those types of things. But that to me is much more interesting or spend the time to develop a course around content that I'm passionate about and that there's demand for, and then put that course out there on, on Udemy or Coursera or one of the many services out there. I mean, that that brings, that definitely brings up something we haven't really touched on. And that is, it's one thing to create this in the vacuum of your own house or, you know, wherever you're at. Uh, It's quite another to sell it at a volume where it makes any sense or any kind of real financial kind of meaningful financial 
contribution to your to your life. And yes. you know, when you raise up this idea of marketplaces, it makes me think, you know, I'm lucky because I have an audience. I've worked a long time to build that audience up, yeah. but you've worked to build it. <laughs> right. But it means that, you know, during COVID, if I decide I want to buy an iPad and make a little sketching pack, it's a lot easier to sell that when you have an audience of, you know, captive viewers already built around topics like sketching, <laughs> you know, I mean, so for me to pretend like, you know, that's a, that's a valid passive income earning asset for somebody who doesn't have an audience is kind of, yeah, that's, that's a little bit of a false narrative there. So, yeah, but that's fair. you know, accessing when you don't have an audience, you have to use somebody else's audience. And in some ways, YouTube can be that audience, right? I mean, you and I are building an audience from nothing here. And we're capitalizing on the fact that YouTube is a search engine. You're talking about Coursera or, you know, Udemy, Skillshare. Those are all marketplaces, right? And so yes. you give something up by making a course and putting it on Skillshare, for example, you know, or Udemy. I think they, they'll set the price of the course for you they and they do. can discount it at any time they want. And so you're giving up control. You don't have customers there, but you do get access to a bigger audience. And so if you build a set of systems around the idea of that, you know, in that example, you build a course um, and you have students in it and you create an email list that speaks to those students. Then you kind of slowly move those students off the course and into your own platform right. uh, on your own website. You know, there is a means for converting these kind of digital tools and these digital marketplaces into much larger passive income generating assets. Help me understand what it was like you know, how, you know, chicken and egg, were you developing some of these passive income streams while you were leveraging the, you know, starting to build your YouTube audience, leveraging the work you were doing for clients or, you know, how did that kind of flow over time? And I imagine for the different types of assets you produce, that would be different too. Yeah. I, I mean, I was always experimenting day one. The reason I got on YouTube was during advertising revenue. So like, I remember my first AdSense payout was like nine cents. I took my phone and I showed Laura on like YouTube studio. I was like, see, this is going to work, you know, like nice. nine, nine pennies. Here we go. And so I always had that, like you, I kind of have that entrepreneurial mindset. Like how can I take what I'm doing, share it with others and, and find out where people are spending money and kind of get in the middle of that, in that stream, you know, that money yeah. stream. And so I, it, it took many, many years, Jay. It's like, it's not, yeah. I mean, I was trying to sell plan, sure. plan sets for many of those years. And I, you know, I did sell plan sets and then I sold custom services on the back of that. Um, but then I started experimenting with a whole bunch of other different things too, you know, including books, you know, yeah. I, and part of that, me writing a book and self publishing a book was just this idea of like documenting what I was doing. I was starting a business. So I was just writing every step of the way down and cause nobody else had done it in a real contemporary way. And then I started documenting what I was doing in the business on video and just putting that out there. And then I started like, if I did a budgeting spreadsheet for my clients and I made a video about it and P and I had, you know, 25 people say, Hey, I'd like to get that. I just, you know, I sold it to them. <laughs> so pretty soon when you do enough of those things, you know, they aggregate into something bigger. And so then instead of selling like $20 products, I started just bunching it up and I created this $150 product. And then, you know, what that did was it suggested, well, if you can get somebody interested in this little thing over here, you know, they're probably going to be interested in this collection of things over here. And then if you build a ladder, to something that's, you know, much more valuable. So say we go from a $20 product to a $150 product. And then when they buy the $150 product, they get a discount for the $700 product. Like you can start increasing the lifetime value of a customer, which is like, you know, the LTV is, is a big thing that they talk about in passive income circles. Um, and it's true for commerce in general, you know, I'm selling physical products now too. So I have like a line of sketchbooks that I sell and I'm working with this guy out of New York city to do that. And he's like, if you want to earn more money, we just need to increase the average order value. And you do that by making pens and rubber bands and like all the things that complement the thing that you're selling. And right. So I think these lessons apply to digital goods too. And, and it's, I mean, 
I can honestly say that when I made that jump to selling more expensive products, the business revenue went up exponentially. So just having that suite of products where you can meet a customer wherever they're at in their journey. You know, if they're down here, if they want the $20 product, you meet them there. And then you just keep feeding them the idea that they probably need the $150 product. And then when they get that, they're like, well, this is really good, man. I mean, maybe I should go for the $700 product. And like, I know it, um, it sounds easy. And looking back, it's easy to find the narrative that gets you from point A to point B. Um, but honestly, that pathway looked a lot like a, you know, a, a tail of spaghetti. It was just yeah. lots of failures and lots of returned products and people complaining <laughs> like missteps along the way. And I just honestly wouldn't give that up. And I, you and I have talked about this a lot where you want to know, okay, what's point A and what's point B. That's, that's like your, that, that is definitely who you are. You see the end result and you find the most efficient path to get there. And that's, you know, you've been paid very well to make that path as efficient as possible. And the problem with transitioning to something like this is it's the inefficient path that actually nets yeah. you the result. <laughs> if you had to think of like, you know, a piece of guidance or a lesson, it doesn't have to be the most important or the most <laughs> impactful, but just something you would share with somebody who's trying to think about I want to do something like this. I don't know what it is, but just something you can kind of set them off to keep in mind as they start to explore, you know, what, what would that be? The tagline that I end all of my videos with is go make things. And, and the reason I say that is it's just the easiest answer for not only, I mean, I always tell my kids there's, there's sort of two types of people in the world. There's people, you know, who make things and there's people who consume those things that other people make. And yeah. I always want to be on the making side of that equation because creatively it's fulfilling. Yeah. Um, but you know, the go make things sort of directive at the end of my videos is very intentional because that's how I got here. <laughs> I mean, I didn't yeah. get here by just consuming things. I went out and I made a bunch of things. And so it's the learnings that happen from all the things that I made that have led me to where I'm at. And so I don't know if that's inspiring to people or not, um, <laughs> but it really is my best advice because there's just no other way between here and there uh, except for doing the hard work of making things. And I think it's just been a perpetual theme in my life. And it's something, you know, my mother Oh, Laura and I were talking about this the other day because our kids were sleeping in till noontime or, oh. <laughs> and we were just like, <laughs> yours you too, know, huh? yeah, right. And, and I said, you know, I'll never go in and wake my kids up and, and say the things that my mother said to me, which was, you're sleeping the whole day away, you know, <laughs> but that idea mm -hmm. was, she wanted me to go hustle and make things. And I, yeah, it was part of who I was as a kid. Yeah, I, I was sure. sitting around and making, you know, really bad art, just like you were, um, model or trains. model trains. Yeah. Like really bad model train setups, but it, it, okay, it all really. aggregates to something bigger than, you know, the sum of the parts. And I, and I, I really do believe that. And I think you believe that too. Um, I really do. And you are understanding it just as we release these episodes, right? We don't know sure necessarily what the next one's going to be or where this nope. is going to go and that's totally cool and and fun and it's not keeping us from making it um but i i believe that if we make it with the spirit of helping other people that that returns something far greater than we could ever have predicted so yeah yeah i think that's well put i like that a lot okay uh, I, I have a thought that i want to share i don't think Please. it's of that mag it's not of that magnitude i think um <laughs> It's a very practical thing that I would throw out there. And it's it's a lesson I learned myself. It's something I shared with Eric um, maybe about a month ago. And I'm somebody who likes to, to, to take a walk every day if I can or a hike. And, you know, I, the neighborhood I live in, it's very easy to just head out the door and go for a nice walk. And I typically would listen to podcasts or audiobooks during that walk and really got a lot out of that because honestly, I wasn't <laughs> reading enough in recent years with yeah. the type of job I had. But I realized something one day in that if I just didn't bring my phone with me, no podcast, no audiobook, 
your mind naturally wanders. Of course it does, uh, right? That's just normal uh, as you walk and consider the, you know, what's around you. But I found that that helps me generate ideas more than anything else. And, and I honestly had not realized that before. That's and cool. and I think yeah. for me, you know, I, I part of my career was in marketing and I always struggled with the creative part of marketing. I much more like the pragmatic part of marketing. <laughs> Um, it's more natural fit for me, right. but to just give yourself the space to not think about something will allow you to think about things. And for me, I came up with more ideas in, in this one walk I'm thinking of. It was an hour and a half in each direction. I, I, I walked to a brewery, to be totally honest with you, but um, <laughs> three hours of that walking, drinking problem. <laughs> now I had one beer because it was really hot out and I, I knew I had an hour and a half walk home. You had to walk um, uphill. <laughs> right. That's, but, thus um, comes the e-bike. Thus comes the e-bike. No, but in all seriousness. Which you probably I, can't drive after having <laughs> six or eight beers, right? Is that yeah, legal? I had one beer. Um, <laughs> I know what one, one beer. I mean, come on, man. Sorry. I'm not it, I'm not trying to steal your thunder it was, here. It, it, was, it was not a large beer, and it was a low alcohol beer, actually. It was a Pilsner. But again, it was a hot day. Not going to have a stout. Um, anyhow. I would miss the podcast thing because that's the, that's the sort of fodder. That's the grist for me. Well, I, so the point is maybe the point to make is I'm not saying you have to go like, you know, a or B, but for me, when I'm struggling with what to write about, uh, on my own blog, if I just go for a walk and don't bring my phone, I don't allow myself to be distracted by anything. I will come up with an idea that I'm going to write about. Now, I'm not saying it's going to be the best idea I ever had, but I have an idea now or I have a couple ideas I can choose from. Yeah. And the same thing happens when I think about um, potential books. Like I thought about like, you know, I decided like, <laughs> oh, I kind of want to write a book. I'd like to try to do that. Um, I came up with four ideas on one walk. Uh, three of them, I'm, I'm, there's no way I'm going to do. <laughs> I just don't think there's value in them, but there are ideas I had, didn't have before. And one yeah. of them I think is pretty reasonable. So, figure out how you can generate ideas, what helps your brain focus or defocus sufficiently so that you can come up with ideas. For me, just removing noise and removing stimulation was a big part of it because honestly, for me, I tend to want to fill my time with stuff. That's how <laughs> totally. I'm wired. Yeah. I want to be learning something, consuming, yeah. growing, becoming better. Me too. And yeah. I have, to clear the deck sometimes. And I think, I think it's also part of why you know, people like us don't sleep very well, right? You're, you're not really turning it off when you go to bed. It totally. continues. Yeah. I might have but, to give but, that a try. That's a kind of walk in silence. I don't know if I could. Once yeah. in a while, maybe just try it one day a week, you yeah. know, or, or something. Anyway, I'm still doing it because I'm still seeing value in it. That's cool. And yeah. um, if it doesn't, I'll find something else. For me, it passive is. income is security. And I, I know. And I love that. That's, that's <laughs> one, that's why I, I mean, I guess, you know, for me, passive income, it, it scratches a couple of itches, right? One, it's like, it's, it's gratifying. It's validating that something you it's have totally validated validated. by yeah. somebody else. <laughs> and I am somebody that seeks validation. I know that. Um, the other is it's security. And I said that earlier, yeah. I love the idea of reducing my monthly spend, right? If my monthly spend can be reduced by 10%, awesome. That's yeah. 10% I don't need to take out of my funds. And, you know, cool. Yeah, and I'm just oh. using it to buy time right now. So, I mean, yeah. obviously I'm using it to fund retirement too, but it's, yes, it's buying a lot of that white space that you were just talking about, you know, the unplugging and, yeah. you know, space for ideas because I was finding that I didn't have that. So it's, yeah, it's a... We're both in really privileged positions. It's good. Totally. It's good to re remember that. <laughs> I do. I, I think about it. I, I feel like daily. Yeah. And it's probably like the writing about it and the wondering how people are responding to the content we put out there or seeing how they respond to it. I don't think I'm going to forget anytime soon. That is a privileged position to be in. Totally. Yes, to your point, we worked hard to get here, but we had a lot of things in our favor growing up, you know, in terms of how our families raised us and totally. took care of us. Yeah. So we are fortunate and uh, you can't forget that.
recent years, I realized just how much strength comes from people who haven't, you know, don't have the same background as you, upbringing, training, right? This yeah. is one of the, the biggest drivers of diversity and inclusion in the workplace is, man, if you don't diversify the experiences and, and, and skills on a team, you're missing a huge opportunity. I think you just made a case for you editing this video then. <laughs> Well, I, I mean, don't get me wrong. I have thought about, boy, at some point I'll be good enough to edit this show. But um, we should. Uh, I hope you saved the first edit of the trailer. I'm not, I'm not that dude. Of course I did. <laughs> and I knew, I, I knew as soon as I made it. Like, like this. oh man, <laughs> you and I told Lori. Oh, I told Lori, your text. Your text was so <laughs> political yet gracious. <laughs> like I was like, Hey, what do you think about this trailer? And he was basically like, it's so great that you spent time working on this. It's basically what you wrote. It was like, it was like the kind of thing you'd say to like your low performer on the team who's, who's, you, who's really trying and you don't want to discourage, you know, you're going to follow that up with, you know, you know, here's some recommendations to, to make it even better. Um, but you start open your like, eyes. Yeah. Like nice effort. You know, it's like, in, like the things I used to hear in little league. Did it like, come oh, off? God. Like it came off that harsh. Wow. No, but texts, right. A text in a vacuum yeah. can only be read with the, whatever knowledge you have of that person. And that's why, right. You know, emojis came, came on <laughs> from the very beginning of the internet, way before social media, because oh, you have to have something, but if you don't have it, you just have words. And I know you, and I'm picturing you with your design aesthetic, looking at this crappy trailer that I made for this show before we actually had any full episodes. Recorded. Hey man, I'm not pretending my stuff's any good either, but you know, it's well, one of those. You've got a lot of people to think it is. So I, I'm glad, I, I'm glad you saved it because that first video, if you go back to the first video on my YouTube channel that I started for my business, it's, it's just downright embarrassing. It's like horrific. <laughs> it's like low here. energy. Yeah, I know. And I keep Everyone's it around cool. because yeah. it's a reminder of how far I've come. And so it, it'll be cool to, we, we have to keep that in the vault. We can't, we can't let that one out yet. We got to get to no. like episode a hundred. 